more discussion on deceptions about polygamy historically by Mormon leadership next on Polygamy, What Love Is This? We continue uh, with our series discussing 101 deceptions, prevarications, dishonesty, and lying for the Lord practiced by the original Mormon polygamous church. Now, these deceptions continue in both the LDS church today, as with all the Mormon polygamy groups. And you can find this list and the comments at the link on the screen. It's at mormonthink.com um, slash lying. With our discussion today is, again, uh, we welcome Dorothy Catlin. Thanks for coming and sharing You're and welcome. participating and and putting in your own two cents worth on uh, some I of I get to read stuff. all the lies. <laughs> <laughs> you get to read all the lies. <laughs> of course, they're easy to detect <laughs> when we go through and compare them with <clears> the <throat> truth. Now, many of these uh, quotes that are in our discussion is taken from the book entitled Solemn Covenant, and it's written by B. Carmen Hardy. It's an excellent book about early Mormon church polygamy uh, that talks a lot about their lies, their deceptions, and what happened during and after the manifesto. Uh, where they claimed to have given up polygamy in 1890, but they really didn't. But it's a very good book, and it's got all the footnotes and all of the references needed to back up what is written in the book. So we ended last time with deception number 75. We're going to start this time with number 76, and that's a big number for well, the well, lies. Uh, that's right. Not counting the We're lies. up to 76 already? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here it comes. Despite consistent denials that church leaders demanded complete and blind obedience, members were commanded that they should subordinate their judgment to that of their priesthood leaders. Leaders dictated matters from the most trivial to the most profound and far-reaching. In fact, men refusing to go on missions were once told that they should anticipate relinquishing their wives for refusing to obey the brethren. This is at odds with the claim by Mormon leaders and apologists that members of the LDS Church have always been counseled to exercise their own agency and think for themselves. Okay, and then there's a lot of things that are at odds with the original Mormon Church and today's what they claim. <clears throat> and then they've claimed that they've always honored free agency. I know I was raised on the free agency idea for individuals, but they don't. They don't honor it. They don't believe in it at all. The, the, the ugly threats and the name calling, the shunning, shaming and, and false allegations that are made against people who choose to leave their religion is scandalous. And it doesn't indicate free agency at all individuals, individuality and critical thinking among members is to be avoided and leaders are not to be doubted or questioned. And that goes for polygamy groups as well as the LDS church. They demand blind obedience, loyalty and conformity. Now, of course, this is not free agency. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention is, have you ever noticed, if you've been, if you've read the Gospels, have you ever noticed that Jesus' followers were constantly asking him questions? But we never read that Jesus told them to stop thinking or to follow him blindly and let him do their thinking for them. In fact, he often replied to their question with a question of his own, which would stimulate deeper thinking on their own. So he wanted them to do critical thinking and, and deeper thinking. In fact, Jesus warned against blindly following religious leaders. He said in Matthew 15, 14, let them alone. They're blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Both, the leader and the blind. Mm -hmm. So pick up your Bible and read the context of some of these things, that, especially that we quote on the show. Uh, Jesus is talking to the educated religious hierarchy of Israel, and he said they're blind guides. Mm -hmm. How true this is, is uh, Mormonism and, and polygamy groups today, and later, the LDS leadership as well. They're blind to what Jesus taught and blind to the matchless grace of God. Deception number 78. Henry S. Tanner explained that when he was forced to lie to protect himself or the church, then the word he spoke, lies told to civil authorities under oath, had no binding power. 
He believed that the Mormons would be regarded by God as having made no promises, nor be accountable for lies told to protect the church. Tanner and others blamed the government for making them lie. <laughs> Lying was elevated from duplicity and degraded communication to a religious duty. And that's from Solemn Covenant. Modern church history is silent regarding this practice. We were taught that in the polygamy group for sure, that it's their fault we're lying. And if we lie to protect ourselves in the polygamy and the group and so on and so forth, that it was a good thing. Um, and, and Mormon church history might be silent about this, but the Mormon polygamy groups aren't. <laughs> They're following in their footsteps. They believe and teach clearly as a blessing to life of the Lord. Uh, now, of course, I have to ask the question, what else can be expected from a religion that teaches that the disobedience of Adam and Eve was a good thing and was exactly what God wanted them to do? What else can we expect from a religion that teaches God commanded Abraham to lie to Pharaoh? Uh, what else can be expected from a religion whose founding prophet lied about his own sexual adventures? who lied about God commanding polygamy and who lied about himself being a polygamist when he had several wives at the time he was lying about it. Deceptions is the foundation. The next deception, number 79. Carl A. Badger, who was not a church member, acted as a friend and counselor to the church leaders during the Smoot hearings, 1903 to 1907. During those hearings, it was discovered that the church leaders had lied and deceived the federal government about its intentions to rid the church of polygamy for decades. Mm. Current LDS histories reject the suggestion to be forthcoming about church leaders' dishonesty and, tubeless, and duplicity. It's just cover-ups, you know, it's just mm -hmm. massive, massive cover-ups and lying. Even today, the official statement from the LDS Church is that polygamy was abandoned by the church in 1890. That's a lie. And they know it is. They, you can check out the history. They did not give up polygamy in 1890. And the trouble is, they say they did then, and they continue to say they did. But can... but. Uh, during those, during the 18, after the 1890s, while they said, after they said they gave up polygamy, they continued to officially and secretly perform plural marriages. Church leaders themselves were marrying plural wives after 1890, and those marriages were recorded. We have them. Mm -hmm. You can find a long list of them in that book I mentioned earlier, Solemn Covenant, the back of the book. They have a long list of the marriages that were performed after 1890 and how and many of them were the religious leaders. Now, in discovering that the Mormon church had been lying about their polygamy for decades, do you suppose that their deceptions helped to establish the national, the even international negative attitudes towards the Mormon church? That, that they proved themselves deceitful and immoral. It's in the history. All you have to do is check it out. And God does not put his stamp of approval on deceptive organizations. Deception number 80. United States senators participating in the Smoot hearings where church leaders repeatedly and systematically lied under oath determined that the decision to lie to protect polygamy and church leaders' practice of it ultimately led to charges of casuistry, secrecy, and moral contradiction. Many concluded that Mormon leaders consistently stood for honesty as long as their own affairs were not involved or when it was convenient. A Gentile expressed it this way, When any of us, non-members, sin, we sin for our own sakes. But when a saint lied, it was done for Christ's sake. Ooh, <laughs> oh. that's a pinch. Again, because of this kind of deceptive behavior, is it any wonder that the Mormons have had to struggle against strong opposition uh, against their religion? And now, of course, the practice of polygamy didn't help their image Everywhere the Mormons lived, their non-Mormon uh, neighbors were afraid they would steal their wives and daughters to become Mormon plural wives. Even today, young men from polygamy groups who cannot get a wife inside the group will go outside the group to find a wife, marry her without explaining his polygamy group connection. Then when they're married, it's too late. She's now part of a polygamy group whether she likes it or not. And that still happens. Mm -hmm. I just recently heard of another one. Now, the father of lies hasn't changed during the centuries, has he? And, and we talk about some of these where they were actually lying in the Senate hearings. Mm -hmm. That's pretty, pretty 
it's pretty bold. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, anyway, deception number 81. The Salt Lake Tribune was at odds with the LDS Church's duplicity in the late 19th century as it related to polygamy and the Church's control of civil government. Adding to the disgust of Tribune editors was that the Church claimed to be the Lord's special vessel of truth, but so often refused to live up to the honor. Tribune editors rejected the claim that institutionalized lying and deception was necessary to protect the Lord's Church. The paper claimed something hard to refute, that it was impossible for a Mormon elder to be a new po polygamist without, at the same time, being a liar. The church leaders compounded the problem by claiming that they had always been honest. <laughs> Current LDS leaders face the same problem. They've always been honest? Mm. History confirms that the deception in Mormonism has not stopped. Now, quoting from the quote... <laughs> Church leaders compounded the problem by claiming they had always been honest, despite the overwhelming evidence, the journals, the news reports, the affidavits, and other historical written histories that institutionalized lying was part of their religious mandate. Mormonism cannot possibly be the Lord's special vessel of truth, as we read in the following scriptures. 1 John 2.21, no lie is of the truth. And John 18.37, and this is Jesus speaking, For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And there you have it. Uh, and that set me thinking about John 8.47, where Jesus says, He who is of God hears the words hears of God. His voice. If you are inclined to... To be after God's truth, you recognize it when you hear it. Uh huh. That's true. And 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 how can you be God's only true church when the foundation is so much deception or the special Jesus, vessel uh, yeah, of truth? Yeah. When no lie comes from the truth, yeah. and Jesus Himself, like you said, you know, God's word, and they don't follow mm -hmm. God's word. They don't believe in it. And of course, the only real vessel of truth was Jesus Himself. Uh, and, and as we said before, those who claim to follow Jesus but don't listen to his voice, rejecting Jesus' teachings, have proven that they are not of the truth, just as Jesus said in John 18. Now, we realize that regular members um, of both polygamy and of the Mormon church are unaware of the deceptions of their present day and early Mormon church leadership. And we also realize that many of the regular members are kind and nice people thinking that they're following God, thinking they're doing what God wants them to do by meekly following the leadership of those who claim to represent God. But we urge each member to stop and to investigate the difference between what Jesus taught in the New Testament and what your Mormon religious leaders teach. You'll be shocked if you will do it with an open heart to believe what Jesus said. Our next deception, number 82. Mormons were inventive in their ability to distort the truth and at the same time convince themselves that they were honest. B. Carmen Hardy has written, in addition to semantic usages such as union and sealing, thus permitting denials of plural marriage, reference has also been made to instances involving the marrying of two wives on the same day, reliance on the fact that women were always sealed to men, allowing their husbands to deny that they had married polygamously. Now that's a tricky one. Use of proxies, Marrying a new wife legally after the death of a prior legal spouse while maintaining relationships with earlier plurals, the performance of ceremonies at sea or in foreign countries, <laughs> and resort to concubinage. That's a tough word to say. The variety of ruses employed will never fully be numbered. That's from Solemn Covenant. Modern church history and curriculum continued the duplicity by refusing to fully admit the lies of the past leaders. And again, it goes to the modern church. They, they can repent. Mm -hmm. They tell everybody else to repent. They need mm -hmm. to repent and fess up to their history of duplicity. Now, that caught my eye. You mentioned that, you know, the men being not being the, sealed to the women. The women the being sealed to the men. You know. Now, the plural wives today really need to think about this. Because females in polygamy uh, affects, 
if, if that's the way it is, and I don't know if that's the way it is in today's modern day polygamous marriages, I contacted Karen Bradshaw, she's from the AUB, to see if she remembered what her marriage ceremony consisted of. And she's going to look into that yeah. uh, for us. And, and we might even do a separate program on that. But it has great implications if the men are not sealed to the women, but the women are sealed to the men, mm -hmm. which is what he said they did in those early days. Right. So that they could say, I don't, I don't, I'm not sealed to many Call women. Plausible deniability. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, right. But if the man is not sealed to the, his plural wives, he has no obligation towards her for right. anything. He doesn't. She has obligation to him, but not he to her. Um, and 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 remember, the man is supposed to call the woman from the grave in the resurrection, but he doesn't. He's not obligated. To she do has that. no guarantee of that, right? Because he's not sealed to her. So a woman can be sealed to the man, but the but the man not to the woman um, is a very very um, iffy doctrine. If they're still doing it today, the women really need to check that out, and I'm going to look into it further too. But I think that was interesting. The, mm -hmm. the, the, that was one of the ruses that they used so that they could lie and right. um, and not say they're lying. And convince themselves they were telling the truth. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And also, we need to also be aware that even if the men aren't sealed to the women, beware what God said, that a man who does not take care of his own family and provide for his families are worse than infidels. Uh, and most polygamy men do not provide for their many families. Deception number 84. One subtle way of deceiving government agents was for church members to say that the church had abandoned polygamy, but individual priesthood leaders might still take new wives. Thus, the rationale was that though the church had abandoned the practice, the priesthood had not. This allowed church leaders to act in a dual role, either as corporate spokesman or individual priesthood holder. At least as far back as President John Taylor, it was understood by some that the responsibility for encouraging plural marriage had been taken from the church and extended to everybody upon his own responsibility. <laughs> Now this this is the thinking of the all red polygamy group, especially. <laughs> they claim to have the only genuine priesthood authority on the planet to practice polygamy. They believe the LDS Church remains God's church, but that they've lost their priesthood authority when they gave up polygamy. And uh, to, the only way you can be exalted in the Mormon celestial glory, of course, is to be a polygamist. So you have to join the all red group in order to get those blessings. Now, of course, each polygamy group claims they have God's authority to seal people into polygamous marriages. It's also mixed up and, and soupy and difficult to even explain how all this makes for a religion that God can approve of. It's entirely to confusion. He's not a God of confusion. At least that's what I've always been told. They cannot all be right, but they can all be wrong. The 85th deception includes the son of leader, prophet, polygamous president John Taylor. Apostle John W. Taylor married Jan uh, Janet Maria Woolley as his third wife only four days after the manifesto banning plural marriage was presented and accepted in general conference. They married in a carriage in Liberty Park at night in Salt Lake City. The family intentionally backdated the marriage date to October 10, 1889. Apostle John W. Taylor married Rhoda Roxy Wellington, Rhoda and Roxy Wellington, excuse me, on 29th of August, 1901, 11 years after the manifesto. The ceremony was performed at the Taylor home in Farmington, Utah. Joseph F. Smith, who was acting as a counselor in the first presidency, gave permission. The subterfuge was regarded as virtuous and necessary by church leaders. Lying for convenience sake was strikingly similar to lying for Christ's sake. This is sad. So sad. Now, he was the son of third president, John Taylor. So he had a very strong polygamous doctrine foundation. In fact, official LDS history indicates he was excommunicated because he refused to give up polygamy and verbally disagreed with their decision to finally abandon it, truthfully abandon it, in 1904. But note from the quote that polygamous marriages were sanctioned and performed by official permission, even claiming the sub subterfuge was virtuous and unnecessary, knowingly backdating the date of the marriage, right. uh, and so they knew that they were lying for the Lord. Uh, it's... it's breaking the laws of God and the laws of the land. And uh, there's no way that God could call that something, something like that virtuous when it certainly disobeys his laws. 
But the Bible does prohibit polygamy in several places. Uh, and lying. And lying, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. There would be that. Well, the Book of Mormon says everyone who lies it will descend into hell. You know, it just... I don't get it. They didn't read the Book of Mormon, I guess. Apparently not. Deception number 88. <laughs> Apostle Mariner W. Merrill took a plural wife in the Logan Temple in 1901, well after the manifesto was accepted as binding upon the church. He denied under oath in front of the Senate committee investigating Reed Smoot that he had married Hilda after 1890. Though the committee possessed solid evidence that he was lying, he continued to insist that he was telling the truth. This is, again, from Solemn Covenant. Perhaps consistency was more important than honesty. These tactics turned the public against Mormons. And that's what I mentioned earlier. Some of this deception, they claim persecution. Right. But they were inviting they a lot it on of... themselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. they were inviting it because of what they were doing. Uh, they, bear, they were bearing false witness. That despite the evidence that was in the Senate's possession, mm -hmm. they continued to maintain their lies under oath. And as we briefly mentioned earlier, it's those kinds of tactics uh, that caused the, the negative judgment against the Mormons in those early days. Deception number 91. Abraham Hoagland Cannon, an LDS apostle, married Annie Cannon after President Woodruff gave him consent to do so in 1894, four years after the manifesto declared an end to all plural marriages. Annie was taken as a concubine. Apparently, church leaders had considered this practice from 1843 on when the revelation to Joseph about plural marriage mentioned that the Lord approved concubinage. Modern church history refuses to admit that this practice, adultery, was part of the church's practice of plural marriage. So actually, we're splitting hairs. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> we call polygamy what is good the things, difference? But concubinage, <laughs> adultery. Technically, both are equally adultery, of mm -hmm. course. God gave instructions in the Old Testament against polygamy, and he forbade the kings of Israel to take multiple wives in the New Testament. He told the leaders of the church, Christ's church not to, uh, but to, to be husbands of but one wife. And 1 Corinthians 7, 2, all Christians are informed that only one husband per woman and one man, um, one wife per man was acceptable. Now, in section 132, Joseph Smith did say that God blessed Abraham Isaac, David, um, Jacob, and Solomon, because they had many wives and concubines, even though the Book of Mormon calls polygamy an abomination. So Actually, the this. Bible never says that. The Bible never says God blessed them because oh, yeah. they had many wives and concubines. That's right. He didn't. The Book of Mormon says that it was an abomination to them. So, yeah, the Bible. And Jacob, um, uh, Isaac wasn't a polygamist either. So, you know, oh, there's so right. much wrong right. in in the what Joseph Smith wrote about polygamy. But, and not, nothing can be wrong and righteous at the same time, mm. you know. Um, the integrity of the author of the Book of Mormon and Section 132 must be, has got to be in question based on what we read about these contradictions. We cannot believe that God is the author of this kind of behavior. Number 96. Bogus divorce in order to mislead legal authorities was acceptable. The logic was that if a fake divorce was necessary to live the higher law of polygamy, it was justified. Also, Mormons believed that earthly divorce was not binding in heaven anyway. In the eyes of the Lord, the couple was still married. <laughs> So here we have more levels of deception going on. <laughs> and, and, and Brigham Young added to that. Fanny Stenhouse wrote in her expose of Mormon polygamy that Brigham Young would charge $10 per divorce and made a pretty good income from it. Brigham Young was deeply involved with those who wanted divorces, or bogus divorces. He said that anyone could get married at no charge, but a divorce would cost them. <laughs> he also said this. <laughs> so far as eternity was concerned, these divorces were not worth the paper they were written on. The people had married for eternity, and it, and in eternity they would have to live together whether they liked it or not. <laughs> he says the same today, but still he sells his divorces and gathers in the ten dollars. <laughs> So that's what I mean. Levels, the levels of the deception that was taking on here. Why did he even give divorces if? 
Right, right. What's they the were, point? They were worthless. Ten it's, bucks. It's ten bucks. Well, how That's much was ten dollars right. in those days? That's a lot to more what than today's it is now. money would be. <laughs> But we have to remind you that there is no such thing as eternal marriage or <laughs> eternal divorce or anything of this sort. So we're going to finish with deception number 100. When B.H. Roberts was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives after Utah became a state, the House voted to exclude him because an investigation revealed that Roberts was engaged in polygamous marriage and that one of his wives had married him after the manifesto. Since it was a clear violation of the law of the land, and he and the LDS leadership had ignored society's legal code, he was declared unfit for office. Seven million citizens signed a petition demanding that Roberts be denied his seat, and it was presented to Congress. Those considered enemies by church leaders were provided a national platform to advertise abundant evidence of dishonesty on the part of Mormon church leaders and members. Official church hist histories and curriculum neglect to inform members and non-members of this and related incidents, nor have they denounced the deceptive practices. And that's the thing. Why don't they admit it, mm -hmm. denounce it, repent, as right. it were, and, and go forward right. from there? But they continue to cover it up. The fact that they refuse to admit it or denounce their historical deceptive and practices makes them unfit to be God's vessel of truth. Now, we know that because God has told us that no lie comes from the truth, and they continue lying about it to this day. So that's the 101, and we just got to 100. So we're going to have to <laughs> come more. up with something. <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy, for participating in this. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Doris. It's my pleasure. You know, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This refers to our relationship with Jesus and not with our human religious leaders. Only Jesus can forgive us our sins and only he can cleanse us. And verse 7 tells us it's his blood that we are cleansed. Our confession is to be a private matter between the sinner and the Savior, and our only Savior is Jesus. Now, polygamists like to boast how powerful polygamy is to make us better people, how it helps us get over jealousy, selfishness, and other problems. That idea puts polygamy in the position of Savior. And if the practice of polygamy causes lawbreaking, telling lies to protect the lawbreakers and the neglect of mothers and children in polygamy, polygamy is not the cause or the cure but is the cause of many problems. So obviously, tossing polygamy and embracing Jesus is the only answer to our sinful nature and all fatal attempts to self-righteousness. So just choose Jesus. Thank you for watching.